All right, so one of the things that you write about a lot is that the idea of middle class stagnation is actually wrong. Yes. We hear this all the time from politicians for I think my whole life that I was ever caring about politics. It's always that the middle class is shrinking and the extremes are getting bigger, et cetera, et cetera. But you actually take a, a different position on it. Yeah, this middle class stagnation thesis is stated as if it's an established fact with no arguments against it. It's, it's, it's just wrong. Uh, I think you were born in the mid 70s, right? 76. And, okay, so the, according to this thesis, it was, a, it was right around that time, mid-70s. I when, apologize. No, that's okay. Yeah, it was your, your fault, right? So, so um, um, the American middle class had been chugging along upward, hit, hits the mid-70s, and then it's been stagnant ever since. So ordinary Americans today, so goes the thesis, live no better than ordinary Americans lived when Gerald Ford was in the Oval Office. I just think this is crazy. I mean, I have, I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately old enough to remember the mid-1970s, and although one's own personal experiences shouldn't be a, the basis for scientific conclusions, they're not irrelevant. I, think, I, know, I, mean, I come from a working class U.S. family. I remember how we lived in the 70s. I remember what cars were like. I remember what television was like. I remember what healthcare was like. Mm -hmm. that, things are a lot better today for, for ordinary Americans. And so I, a number of years ago, just started looking into this this thesis. Uh, there are data that you can find that the people who propose this thesis uh, uh, point to uh, uh, that, that lend some superficial credence to the thesis. But the, so, the, here are just some of the problems with, the, with these data. Uh, they uh, adjust for inflation in ways that vastly overestimate the amount of inflation that we've had since the mid 70s. So I mean vastly undercounting the growth in real incomes since the 70s. A lot of these data will look at household incomes. Uh, well, the, si the typical uh, population of the American household has fallen since the mid-1970s. Today, it doesn't sound like much, but today it's about 11 percent lower mm -hmm. than it was in 1975. Uh, but that's actually pretty significant. So the same amount of income in a household now is spread over fewer people, and so the individ individual people are, are are, are, are richer. Meaning we're just not having as many kids. That's, that's we're, we're, we're not having as many kids. We're, we're, we're becoming wealthier so that now, I don't know, maybe not in the last 10 years or so, but for much of this period, uh, younger pe people have been able to move out of their, fam uh, their parents' homes at a younger age and start their households younger. Uh, uh, older people are able to continue to live by themselves rather than move in with their, with their children. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of goods and the variety of goods and services that American, ordinary Americans have access to today is astonishing compared to what it was just 40 years ago. Uh, I actually spend a lot of time looking at you know, catalogs from the mid-1970s, you know, Sears Roebuck catalogs. Uh -huh. And then you can look at you know, Sears.com today. And you can look at the prices that were charged back then. Of course, nominally they were lower, mm -hmm. but then you just take those prices and you divide them by the wage that the average American earned back then. And you do the same thing for the prices today and divide it by the wage of the average American earns today. And what you find in almost all cases uh, is that the amount of time it takes to work in order to earn enough income to buy a pair of jeans, uh, a shirt, a, a washer and dryer, uh, an, air, an airplane ticket, is dramatically less today. America, we don't have to work as much today as we did back then in order to get the things that make our standard of living as high as it is. So did they just, the people that believe in this, did they just do a great sell job? I mean, how did this meme, how did this idea get out there? Because you hear this all the time. Everybody, all I mean, this is one of the few things it, that you hear on it, both sides it, of the aisle. Yes, yeah, in, in fact, I, I <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I, I think the a lot. Paul Krugman says it all says it all the time, and I think in a way it kind of backfire on people on the left because they keep saying it, and that, I, I believe that's one thing that that helped uh, uh, drum up popular support for Donald Trump. Yeah, you know, middle class Americans have been stagnating, so let's do something about it. Let's elect Trump. There, there's and, an interesting psychological thing there because I think maybe most people think they're in the middle. Like they probably think it, no matter what. Like they, if they're not destitute and if they're not. You, you know, worth 20 million bucks, you probably think basically you're in the middle. Yes. So it's a way of making it about you, even if it's actually not the case. Yeah, I, I, your question, I'm not sure exactly, exactly why it caught, why this myth caught on and it has held on with such tenacity. Uh, this myth has been going, has been around now for 20 years. It started in the mid 1990s. Yeah. Uh, and it was actually an, an economist. He's now at Southern at SMU in Dallas. He was at the time an economist at the Dallas Fed, a guy named Mike Cox, and he's the first one who really started looking into this. He said, "Well, let's 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 look at various 
uh, measures of living standards. Let's look at how much ordinary people are consuming today compared to in the mid-70s. Let's, let's, let, let's, let's look at what happens when we adjust for income using better inflation adjusters. Com uh, uh, what Mike Cox found, and I, I, my work is derivative of Mike Cox, is that once you start doing this, this whole middle class stagnation thing just crumbles into dust. It's just not true. It's not to say that there are no problems. It's not to say that the middle class wouldn't be even wealthier had there, not, had there been better policies in place, whatever you think those policies might be. But it is to say that it's just crazy to believe that an ordinary American or an ordinary American family in 2018 has a standard of living that is indistinguishable from that of an ordinary American family in 1975. Yeah, do you know what basically the economics look like if you're considered in the middle class right now? Like the economics, are there really like numbers that you look at on both sides and go, all right, that's what middle class is? Because I think that's part of the problem. It is this sort of amorphous term. Yes, yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't believe that there, I mean, you know, the, the, the Census Bureau, among others, they will divide household income into quintiles. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall what those numbers are at the moment, but a common definition is you take the, th the three middle quintiles. So you get rid of the top 20%, you get rid of the bottom 20%, and you have the middle 60%. That's, that's the middle class, you know, upper middle, 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 lower middle. Uh, but the Census Bureau d does something interesting. From time to time, it act so it, it, it divides household income into different categories, less than 15,000, 15,000 to 25,000, on, on up to like, I think, 250,000 and above, and it tracks adjusting for inflation, it tracks household incomes over time. And you can, in a perverse way, find in these data that the middle class in America is disappearing. Right? But it's disappearing into the upper classes. Mm -hmm. If you look at the percentage of households in America who are earning uh, in the lowest percentages, right, they're shrinking. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only categories in which the percentage of households in the US are, are increasing are in the upper income levels. And so, the, actually, I think the very lowest, it might have ticked up a little bit, like the less than 15,000. Mm -hmm. But in the great middle, uh, the, they have fewer households, percentage-wise, earning in those categories today, uh, but more earning $100,000 annually and above. And so, in one sense, yes, it's shrinking, but it's getting richer. There's no evidence that we're getting poor. There's no evidence that it's stagnating. Yeah, so we talked a little bit in an ancillary way about taxes yeah. uh, earlier. So. I'm not an economist, but I'm gonna lay out what I think is sort of a fair tax system that's consistent with all the ideals that we've talked about here. And I want you to you okay. probably get I have, I have my ideas yeah, too. Right. So, that's, so that's either, I'm gonna, either I'm gonna blow your mind or you're gonna tell me that I'm way off. So something like this, this is what I've said a couple times, is that I'm basically for a tax, a flat tax, you yep. can get rid of exemptions. Let's say it's about 15%, but we can, we can fiddle with the numbers, but let's, about 15%. I would exempt everyone making, let's say, less than like 40 grand, maybe even 50 grand, so that they have a little more disposable income that they can do things which, which I think is good for them and good for the economy. And then just because I'm still, I still have a little bit of a guilty liberal in me, I would even be willing to do some sort of progressive tax if you're over, say, 10 million a year or something like that, even though I know it's not right and I'm sure you can get rid of that <laughs> yeah. by the end of this conversation, but there's still a piece of me that says that. But basically saying that for the huge, vast majority of the country, 15%, little exemptions, maybe a little trickery on the high end. Yeah. I think that's consistent with the sort of classical liberal idea of minimal involvement and, and equality of opportunity and what you're all paying in, and hopefully it would cause a slimmer, trimmer government. Yeah, so I saw I, some glimmering in your eye in some Yeah, so, so I said earlier, I think one of the distinguishing features of an economist is always asked as compared to what, right? As compared to what we have now, right? That's, that's, a, that's close to perfect. Right? All right, I'll take all right, it. All right. uh, as, as compared to what my actual ideal would be, given that we're going to have taxes, it's, it's not quite my ideal. I, I would indeed get rid of the, 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 the progression yeah. at, at the top. That's just the at, guilty part of me, yeah. I think, that still exists. I, I was so, one of them so for the, a long the, time. So the way I look at, the way I look at people who earn those kinds of incomes, assuming they earn them, in, and most of them do, they earn these incomes in the market. That means that these people are especially good at making life better for ordinary Americans. They're especially good at creating jobs. They're especially good at, at increasing the value of my 401k. But what would you say when people say, but they don't need eight yachts and helicopters and all that? 
Uh, I would say they earned, it's theirs. It's not up to me to say what they, they earn, it's I their know. money. I, I can't make an it, argument against it, I know. It, it's <laughs> theirs. Uh, I mean, look, again, you know, the, it, it, your system is better than what we have now. But uh, definitely, if we're going to have income taxation, a flat tax, and I'm willing to have the exemption for the lower, lower incomes, flat tax is the way to go. Uh, 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 not only does it uh, prevent a lot of political chicanery, you know, messing with brackets, and uh, 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 but it, it, it's, it is economically uh, the better system. Uh, when you tax all income earning activities at the, at the same rate, then the relative prices of different types of labor services stays the same. Mm -hmm. When you have progressive taxation, you create greater distortions in the economy, and that that makes us as an as as a, as residents of this economy, it makes us all a little bit less wealthy than we otherwise would be because the economy has to deal with these distortions. So what do we do about spending? Because at the end of the day, that seems, at least when we're talking about this from a government perspective, yeah. that it's really all about spending, that you can tax out the wazoo and regardless of whether that tanks the economy or, or fixes it or whatever, that that's almost irrelevant if you just keep spending, especially because of the amount of debt we have and we're, we know we're never gonna pay it back, which is why it's probably good that we have a lot of bombs, yep. but that's a whole other, that's a whole other discussion. Um, you know, because one day if China calls in the debt, you know, we're, we're in a lot of trouble. But but how do you rein in spending? Because this seems to be the thing that all the Trump people, right? They all thought he was going to rein in spending. This omnibus thing. quite the opposite. Pack and and it's it's. I think it's more than ever before. It is. It is. Yeah. Uh, so I think the big pro it, the question is, I, I don't know how, how how to do it. We can speculate about you know changing the constitution, putting constitutional balanced budget amendments constitutional caps on spending. I'm skeptical of all of those things. The government has many ways to get around these, these paper tiger provisions. Uh, the problem is, the problem is Americans today look to government and they, and they, they basically you're spending other people's money. And so if you're spending other people's money, it's easy to spend. My, my former colleague, Russ Roberts, had a piece in the Wall Street Journal many years ago entitled something like, uh, if you're paying, I'm having steak. So imagine, you know, <laughs> imagine you know, we all go to a restaurant and you know, the different menu items, right? Well, if you go to a restaurant and, you, and you're picking up your part of the tab, right? You, you, you may order steak, but that's because it's worthwhile to you and, and, and you'll have to pay for it. Uh, but you might, if you have to pay for it, you might not order steak, you might order a, a, a less expensive dish. But if it's gonna be, even if it's just gonna be shared, right? Mm -hmm. Then, based, then the, the bulk of your extra expenditure is shared with the people you're going to dinner with. And that's true for every person at that dinner. Right. And so you wind up with this bizarre s circumstance where every person acting rationally winds up ordering too much, winds up asking of the restaurant too much. We wind up asking of our government too much, but we have to pay for it. S the resources do not fall out of the sky free. They're coming from somewhere. And, and because we're spending too much, we're taking resources from where they would be better used and putting them where really none of us want them to be used, but we all wind up using them there. I know you said before that an anecdotal story is not you know, proof of a bigger theory, yeah. but as you're saying that it reminds, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, publicly before, at my brother's bachelor party, when I was a struggling comic and I had no money, you know, I had maybe 50 bucks in my pocket, I don't know. I was the best man, all his friends were in banking and lawyers yeah. and they had all had money, big rollers. We're at a fancy, one of the one fancy place, the Borgata in Atlantic City, the one fancy, you know, nice place in Atlantic City. And we're sitting around this huge table at a really super fancy restaurant, and I'm and all the entrees are 80, 90, 100 bucks, and I'm looking around, I'm like, I, you know, what am I gonna do here? Yeah. I was gonna get the chicken for maybe 50 bucks or something, and I was <laughs> sitting with my, my brother's one friend who also was kind of struggling like I was, yeah. and we're both saying, all right, we're gonna get the chicken for 50 bucks. We go around, everyone's getting steak, lobster, steak, lobster, steak, lobster, steak, lobster. It gets to my friend Josh, he turn, he's the whole time he's going, I'm getting the chicken, 50 yeah. bucks. The waitress says, what do you want? He goes, lobster. And then I just said, steak, like that. Like, and it's exactly what you're talking it, about. It, you suddenly lose concept of what's in your pocket. Somehow it's gonna happen, right? Well, if the bill's gonna be shared, then the, 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 the additional cost to you of ordering steak well, a dollar, is a so tiny that. fraction of the actual additional cost of the steak. And that's the problem with, with government today. We have people in Washington spending other people's money for the benefit of yet other people. And when you do that, you just get too much, too much spending. Uh, we, we've, I don't know a better way to say it. It doesn't sound very economic, I understand it, but we've lost an, the ethic of respecting other people's property. Once government gets money, once government officials figure out something that they fancy is, is, is good and may or may not really be good, uh, 
which doesn't mean necessarily it's worthwhile, but it may be a good project. That doesn't mean that therefore we should go ahead and spend money on it. Uh, th th there's an insufficient connection between the spending and the, and, and, the, and the experience of the cost of the resources that go into the spending. How much of, you th of this do you think is not an economic problem, but a political problem? So that if a politician was to get this, right? Let's say there's some magical politician out there who really understands economics, but he knows if he goes to the Senate, so I suspect Rand Paul's kind of like this. I yeah. think he basically gets this. Yeah. And he does fight, the best fight generally that I think he can, but that they, these guys want to get reelected. And yeah. saying to people, we're gonna spend less on you, even though, you know, it's, it's the best thing we can do for you, actually. It's gonna free you yeah. one day, and it's not gonna tank the economy and make us, you know, slaves to a foreign nation and all that. It just doesn't work politically because it's not the easy answer of I, I, give them more. I think it's exactly right. Let's face it, each politician has a time frame that extends to the next election, right? So in the case of members of the House, that's only two years. In the case of the president, that's f four. Senators, six. That's not a long time frame. Anything beyond that time frame is irrelevant to that person politically today. Uh, or to make it relevant, that person has to have an ethic that is very rare and unusual among politicians, and people with that ethic tend not to, be, not to succeed in politics. Yeah. A handful do manage to get in, but very few. So you have people without that ethic, and they're just looking toward the next election, which is at most, again, only two years away for, for a House member. And so if the bill's coming due two and a half years from now, if, the, if whatever co other costs are going to happen two and a half years from now, uh, or, or uh, alternatively, if, if taking some action that's only going to have costs today, but, but huge benefits, no matter how huge, two years from now, four years from now, they're not going to take it. Right. Because it's, it, 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 that will do nothing to get them past that next hurdle, which is getting elected, re-elected. So in a very depressing sense, or in, in a sort of dystopian future sense, are we, in a certain way, are we on a pathway to destruction no matter what, if you think about it? I mean, yeah. if, if you take that line of thinking long enough, right? So we have a sort of weak political crew dealing in ways that are the reverse of how economically we can be successful. You're pretty, right? Like yeah. you're pretty much always going off the, off the cliff. Yeah, so I, I, despite all that I've said, I remain optimistic and I'm not, I'm not sure why. Right. Uh, I feel the same way, generally. I, 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 I remain optimistic. Um, we, we still have uh, respect for private property in the United States. We st we're still a very entrepreneurial culture. Uh, uh, we still hold politicians to some, well, this is less now, but to some level of of I don't know, responsibility. I, I, I say that I'm, my libertarian friends are going to kill me for saying it. <laughs> I, I, I think there's something there's something there. Yeah. Uh, look, the political problem has always been there. I think the cost, U.S. Constitution in the past, up until about 80 years ago, maybe did serve more as a constraint. That has largely been shoved yeah. away. Yeah. Um, but by and large, we've still prospered over the past 80 years. Uh, almost in spite of, of ourselves. So there's, some th there's something in the American mindset, there's something in our gumption, uh, and I, I don't want to sound like a rah-rah, but, but there's something about this society of ours that remains, remains relatively open, remains relatively free, property, pri property rights remain relatively secure. I think we still have something of a, of a rule of law in in place, and what I've learned in the 40 or so years that I've been pondering these issues is that a free society is far more robust than I once believed it to be, which is not to, to excuse or justify any of the abuses that it takes, but it's really robust, and I have no good sense of where the point is. I don't, I don't believe it's indestructible. Yeah. But I have no good sense of where the point is where you, you, know, you hit that point and suddenly things are, are destined to go into the, into the gutter. We, we may be m moving there now. I have a 21-year-old son. For his sake, I certainly hope we're not close to that. Uh, but my gosh, if you look back to the 1930s, I think things were even worse then. Idea-wise, you know, the, the, the trend of government-wise than they are today. And yet, we did pretty well. I, I'm glad that you just said idea-wise, because one of the things that I focus on here is talking about ideas. They I mean, matter. That's, that's, that's the whole purpose of what I do. Do you think that these ideas related to freedom and the individual 
and laissez-faire capitalism and all of the things that we've discussed here are taking root again because that's how I started. You mentioned my interview with Thomas Sowell right yeah. before we started. And I sense it. And again, this is, I can only tell you what I'm personally feeling and what, what I, the feedback I get and all that. But I said to Thomas, or to Dr. Sowell, I said, do you realize the, the renaissance your work is having? And I think he's kind of he's kind of just over it personally. Yeah. I think he's proud of his work. Yeah, but I think, he should be. Yeah, and of course yeah. he should be. But I think just on a personal note, he's kind of like, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time, and, and that's great. But I really sense these things are taking root again, even though the mainstream media won't let you really believe that, and they still will always elevate the people that are pushing a lot of the, the more socialist stuff instead of some people with some... So getting, getting back to something I, we said earlier, uh, I think it took a lot of people by surprise in the late 1970s when the ideas for cutting marginal tax rates, deregu deregulation, uh, 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 took hold. And I think that's because people like Milton Friedman, uh, my, my late colleague James Buchanan, had been working years earlier in helping to, at Hayek, and working years earlier to, to make these ideas sound and, and, and accepted. And they were in place. And when the crisis of the 70s hit, those ideas had an effect. Uh, no one knows the future. The future is not destined to repeat itself in the way that it did then. But there are a lot of really good people. You, you, you're doing great work. Uh, uh, there are a lot of really creative young people today push, uh, refining these ideas, polishing ideas, presenting them to the general public in new and more interesting ways. And uh, maybe it's a uh, hope over <laughs> experience, maybe hope over, I don't know, hope over reality. Yeah. But uh, I actually believe that the, these ideas are strong. I think they are appealing. And they are out there. And, and while today, you know, May 19, May 2018, yeah. uh, we can't see when they'll take root. But I think that they will, in fact, protect us. That's, uh, so that is the optimist in you, and I have that yeah. too, because otherwise how could we do what we do, right? I mean, if, if the answer, if you had looked at me 10 minutes ago and said, yeah, pretty much we gotta go <laughs> yeah. off the edge, then, then where then, are then, we? Then, 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 then I would have drunk, had some of the booze you have yeah. uh, about behind me, so let's just start drinking right now, and, yeah, just, yeah, and yeah. just wait for Armageddon. Right. Yeah, no, I, 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 look, I believe, here's something I, that, that I did not fully appreciate 20 years ago that I do appreciate now. 20 years ago, I was a more, uh, Hard-nosed economists. Now ideas are really irrelevant. They don't matter that much. It's it's you know you know the, the institutional constraints. I do think institutional constraints matter. They're important, but I've come to see ideas as by far the single most important constraint and fuel for a society. Yeah. I've been largely affected by uh, the work of Deirdre McCloskey, who I think you... I've had on. It was you, one of my favorite you, chats that we've you, had you, here. you interviewed. Deirdre's work has influenced me greatly, and her work, she's not the only one, but she's done more than any other modern economist to make the case for the role of ideas, and I think she's correct. She's correct in that. So in that, you must be incredibly hopeful then, because I, I, mean, I feel the idea revolution. I've, I'm on tour with Jordan Peterson now, and I keep going up there and saying, there's, an, there's the right kind of revolution happening. We're not killing each other in the streets yet. And how does that get stopped by an idea revolution? Yeah, and, and so, so at the beginning, I, I, I mentioned that uh, I, I came to economics because I was impressed how economics explained the gasoline shortages of the 1970s. So I don't know if you remember, a few years ago, you know, gasoline, Obama was in office, gasoline prices mm -hmm. are, are rising, people are complaining. Here's the importance of idea, ideas. There were, there were no serious calls, even the, in the Obama administration, to go back to 1970s style price caps on, on energy. I took that as a, as, a, huh. as a good sign. It's not saying it won't happen in the future, but I believe the reason that was the case is because the economists who, ex Milton Friedman, in, in, uh, among others, who explain the devastating roles of price ceilings on energy, those ideas were still around. They were still out, they're still out there. And they prevented anyone who would propose such policies seriously from being taken seriously. And so that, the, that notion of returning to the 70s style price caps just never got a hearing a few years ago when gasoline prices were high. So that, 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 that's one uh, data point that supports uh, our optimism. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, I, you know, it, it's a long game, right? I mean, that, that's the point. It, it is a long game. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, regulation before, before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, you may know him, the uh, biology professor, Brett Weinstein, who's been on the show and he's a, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he made an interesting comment to me the other day. I think maybe he tweeted out and then we discussed it a little bit. 
about, well, if you're, if you're taking the true libertarian approach and you're against all regulation, well, are you saying that you want no regulation over the airlines, for example, to have any safety regulations or anything like that? And what I, we didn't have a ton of time to get into the conversation. I said, I said, Brett, very quickly what I would say is, I think airlines are in the business of getting people from one place to another, and they do all their due diligence, and if the idea of a government bureaucrat coming in to f make sure that this little thing is this way, as if they have more knowledge about it than the, the airline people, I find that to be pretty faulty, but, but we sort yeah. of left the conversation there. Yeah. What, do you, what is the right amount of regulation as a, as a libertarian? Oh, I'm in favor of huge amounts of regulation, and I'm, I'm not being facetious. I love regulation. I believe the best regulator that, is, really is, is, is the market. It's the competitive market. It's consumers being able to spend their money uh, as they choose and, or not to spend it as they choose. It's the freedom of different uh, uh, producers and entrepreneurs to enter markets or leave markets as they choose. It's the competition among producers. That's where real regulation comes from. The market regulates activities. You're, you're right about the, the airlines, uh, instance, uh, airlines, for example. Uh, no one has a stronger incentive to make sure that a multi-million dollar piece of machinery doesn't just willy-nilly fall out of the sky than the owner of that multi-million dollar piece of machinery, namely the airlines or the company that they're, they're, they're renting it from. And so the competition among the airlines, the, 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 the need for them to protect their investments, that is a tremendous source of regulation. And it's a very nuanced source of regulation. It gets it right, and it's not subject to political control or political manipulation. So uh, gov so-called government regulation is too often uh, actually deregulation in the worst sense. It's government relieving businesses of the need to be as responsive to consumers as they would otherwise need to be. So we, we, we call, for example, uh, 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 occupational licensing, and that's a form of regulation. Well, no, it's a form of deregulation. It, 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 de dereg it, it deregulates the uh, existing producers in the market from having to be as responsive as they otherwise would to consumers. So, for example, this would be like you have to have a license to cut hair y yes. in California. Or yes. Something. Yeah. yeah. And so, if 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 I if I'm a hair braider or a barber uh, or or an electrician, and if this if the government prevents p people from entering in competition with me. That makes my life easier. I don't have to be as responsive to consumers. I can charge higher prices. I can supply uh, less high quality services. And so I am deregulated, in fact, by that so-called regulation. So basically you would say it's the risk you have to take to be free, right? So that, in other words, that if you're an electrician and I have somebody come into my kitchen, we had a little light thing the other day, now, yes, the guy was licensed, I guess, because yeah. he's gotta be licensed. But you're saying it's just the risk that you have to take because he doesn't want to come in here and burn my house down. And so. nor do you want him right. to do it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and so this is another unintended consequence of so-called so government regulation in that if people come to depend on it too much, they just assume whoever you call up, you know, call up and say, you know, I, I, I need some electrical work done in my house, then, well, we live in a state where electricians are regulated, so this guy must be okay. Um, uh, maybe, maybe not, but if you knew that was up to you, to check. Mm -hmm. First of all, the market supplies all these wonderful ways of, of verifying uh, quality. So if, if anyone was free to practice being an electrician, uh, you would have easy access, you as a consumer would have easy access to various to, uh, uh, mechanisms to, 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 to rank various electricians by how Especially good or now bad with they are. Yelp and all the apps. And, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a total myth to think that the government is more concerned about our welfare and our property than we are. Who's more concerned about your house than you are? Who's more concerned about your personal safety than, and health than you are? Uh, the government might pretend that it's more concerned or that it somehow has deeper insight to what is best for you, but I don't buy it. Uh, I, think, I think young children, uh, they're, uh, they don't know their interest as well as their parents do, but once you become an adult, the presumption must be that each of us as an adult cares for and knows our best interests much better than any third party does. I'm re reminded of something else right now. I think maybe I got too many of my old economic theories from The Simpsons, because <laughs> do, do you remember the episode very early on with uh, Mr. Burns at the power plant, and he's leaking you know, nuclear waste into the river, and they get a three-eyed fish. Yeah. And every, the whole idea being, if you just let business do what it wants, it's gonna pollute the river, and you're gonna be eating three-eyed fish. But that's completely the reverse of everything you've said. There. Yeah, so, so, so what, what an economist would say to that as well, you know, there are some areas where 
uh, uh, your actions as a private citizen spill over onto uh, 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 innocent third party, so they mm -hmm. have no input. So reasonable people can disagree about the proper role of government in, in preventing pollution or, or preventing third party effects. But so much regulation has nothing to do with third party effects. It's simply to say, you know, if you want to get your hair braided, uh, you have to go to one of these people that we approve. You're not allowed to go to that person over there uh, who, who does not yet have our approval. Well, there's no third party effect here. And a surprising amount of regulation is of that sort. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I bought this house and you have to have all the people come by and the inspectors and everything, and they're looking for these little absurd things that I'm talking with the builder about, and, well, this has to be an inch this way over here and blah, 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 and it's like, you, there was no answer for it. I mean, a couple times I said, well, why is that? And they yeah. said, well, it, it, it's the regulation. That's just, that's how, that's how, <laughs> it's that, the regulation. That's how it is. Some, someone in Sacramento said this is how it should be. And, and that's how it is, and everybody, everybody has to talk. So another problem with government regulation uh, is, is that it's one size fits all. And I don't care how smart you are or, or uh, uh, how, mm -hmm. how much experience you have in, in the past, uh, you know, particularly in our, highly in our highly dynamic economy, things are always changing. Different people have different risk tolerances. Um, so you know, one, of, one of my least favorite regulators is the FDA. Uh, there are very few third-party effects with the FDA. The FDA is uh, uh, drug regulation affects you, and it prevents you in co consultation, if you choose, with your doctor, and most sensible people would consult with a physician, uh, from choosing what level of risks you're able to subject yourself to in order to relieve yourself of pain or to, to, to fend off him in a death. I don't believe that's any bureaucrat's business but yours. You may make a decision different than, mm -hmm. differently than I do, but so what? We all have different tastes. We all have different preference, preferences. We all have different tolerances. I don't believe that it's the government's position to say, no, 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 your preference for risk is, is too great. We are not going to let you take this experimental drug because we think it might hurt you. I don't see that's the government's business at all. That's your business. Right. And you better get as educated as possible. I mean, this is where I would say it comes down to education. And, right? and, and, but, but who has a better incentive to, to yeah. become informed and educated in the matter than, than you? It's your life. Yeah. Right? And uh, 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 yes, you can tell stories. Well, you know, maybe you won't. But I, then I can tell stories too. Well, how do you know that this bureaucrat over here is going to do as good a job? I'm willing to bet that you are much less likely to, to, to be uh, 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 t less careful. Yeah. with your life than this guy or gal is with your life. Yeah, all right, so since you said it was a long game and I know how much Hayek has influenced you and you write at cafehayek.com, yeah. um, what are the ideas of Hayek? I know we've actually explored a lot of them here, yeah. but if there was something that uh, I told you before that a lot of my audience, they go out and they, they get books after and they start reading on all of this, uh, what, what are some of the ideas of Hayek that you would like to impart? That I've touched on that, so that, many that, of that, that society is vastly more complex than we understand it to be, particularly a, a, a market-oriented global society. You know, we talk about it in big terms, we talk about the labor market, uh, the amount of trade, you know, the, the GDP numbers. All these terms and numbers mask enormous underlying complexities. All the action that makes our society work is done at the local level. Uh, and that, that's a core Hayekian insight. And if you start acting at, this, at, the, at the higher level, the risk is that, that you will stamp out, you'll, you'll st stomp out, you'll smother these uh, individual adjustments at the local level that actually whose consequences bubble up to the top to, to, to make it all work. There's a great Hayek He's not the most quotable of, of guys, but it's a great Hayek quotation. I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it goes something like, the curious task of the economist is to uh, uh, remind men of how little they know about what they imagine <laughs> they can create, right? So, you know, we can imagine, Bernie Sanders imagines he can create a world of, where everybody gets paid at least $15 an hour. Uh, there's other people imagine they can create a world in which, in which no one is, it dies because of you know a drug overdose. Or, uh, well, well, you can't create that world. It's far too complex, and that's the that's the critical Hayekian insight. The world's really complex, and therefore, if it's really complex, we want to devolve decision-making authority down to the lowest possible level, and not have people who are slathered in hubris uh, uh, making decisions for those of us on the ground. 
on that note, I think you're an excellent communicator of those ideas. So well, that, that's what it's all about, right? And it's, it's reciprocated. Yeah. Thank you very much. And for more on Don, check out cafehayek.com.